Welcome to my AP Physics 1 lesson on momentum. Momentum. That might sound a little bit different than what you've heard before, but it is P equals MV. Momentum is mass times velocity. So it clearly starts with a P. Okay, maybe the M was already taken by other things, such as mass. But uh, mass times velocity is momentum. Now, you can kind of define momentum as inertia in motion. The more mass something has, the more inertia it has. The, moment, the more mass something has, the more momentum it has as well. Uh, the difference is, is that velocity also obviously comes into play. So an object with a velocity of zero has no momentum, uh, where it will have inertia. So it is inertia in motion. The more mass, the more velocity, the more momentum. Now, this is going to really come into play with collisions. So let's go ahead and start taking a look at some collisions. So the first sort of example I'd like to look at would be an elastic collision. Okay, So an elastic collision is one in which kinetic energy is conserved. Okay, kinetic energy is conserved. You'll have to excuse my writing. But uh, kinetic energy is conserved in elastic collisions. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say that all of it, okay, so all kinetic energy is conserved in elastic co collisions. And I have to be very careful to enunciate properly, and you'll see why in a minute. So what does that mean, that kin all kinetic energy is conserved? Well, here I have an example of a, a billiards set of billiards balls. And in this example, all of the balls uh, are basically the same mass, and they exhibit elastic collisions. So if you hit a cue ball and you want to knock in the eight ball, the cue ball comes straight up. It hits the eight ball head on, and that is kind of a crucial point here, is that it's going to hit head on. And because it is an elastic collision, the kinetic energy is conserved. They both have the same mass the cue ball will come to a complete stop and the eight ball will then move and it will move specifically at the same velocity that the cue ball was moving at before they collided. So if the velocity of the cue ball is one meter per second, it's gonna to come to a stop and the eight ball then moves at one meter per second and you pocket the eight ball. When I've uh, taught people how to play pool, this was actually my biggest tip on uh, for people to improve their game on playing billiards is that when people play they often hit the ball way too hard way harder than they have to and that creates a lot of extra motion and uh, jerky motion that, that is unnecessary so the trick is to take the eight ball out of the equation hit the cue ball only just as hard as necessary to actually get it to trickle into the pocket practice that a few times and then put the eight ball or another ball in in its way the cue ball will come to a stop the eight ball then moves, and the eight ball will then trickle into the pocket. So if you, uh, if you ever play billiards, give that one a try, practice it, it will improve your game quite dramatically. So what, what can we, how can we express elastic collisions? So here's what we're going to do. We're gonna say that the, and let me kind of get back to my writing here. So we're gonna say that the momentum Okay, so the momentum of object one, let's say the object one is the, the cue ball, the one that's going to come in and hit, uh, plus the momentum of object two. These are in fact lowercase p's, but you know it's hard to express that. The momentum of object one plus the momentum of object two before the collision is equal to the momentum of object one plus the momentum of object two after the collision. And this quote, it's actually a prime symbol, uh, it means the momentum after. So this is said as P1 plus P2 equals P1 prime plus P2 prime. Now, if it is elastic, okay, so if it is elastic, then we are going to say that the kinetic energy of ball one plus the kinetic energy of ball two is equal to the kinetic energy of ball one after the collision plus the kinetic energy of ball two after the collision. This part is true only if it is elastic. Okay, only, okay, only 
if it is elastic, this statement is true. However, this statement down here is true for all momentum collisions. Momentum is conserved in all collisions. Let me say that again. Momentum is conserved in all collisions. Kinetic energy is not, okay? Energy is conserved, but not kinetic energy specifically, because that energy can be transformed into thermal energy, for example, or potential. But in all collisions, uh, momentum is conserved. So let's break this down a little bit further. So since momentum is mv, I'm going to say that m1 v1, right, the momentum of object 1 is equal to m1 v1, plus m2 v2. So this is the momentum of object 1 plus the momentum of object 2 before the collision. That is going to equal m1 v1 prime. I put the prime symbol with the velocity, not the mass, because the mass doesn't change, the velocity does. Plus m2 v2 prime. Again, the prime goes with the velocity because this is the velocity after the collision. This is the velocity of object 2 after the collision. And so uh, you'll notice here that in this case, uh, if you have two objects that are of you know, different masses, Okay, so you have two different objects. Let's say that the, the cue ball was bigger. Ooh, okay, we just made the cue ball big. And the cue ball comes in and hits the eight ball. Clearly they're not the same mass. So this cue ball no longer comes to a stop. Even in a head-on collision, the cue ball will not come to a stop. And think about what will happen. Will it, it's not gonna come to a stop, we've said that. Will it continue or will it bounce backwards? Think about that. Okay, so a large object hitting a small object. Elastic collision it actually will continue forward. It has so much mass, it will continue forward. What if that ball had a tiny amount of mass? Ooh, it's tiny. Oh, I did not mean to move that. Let's see if I can undo that. Make it a little bit bigger. Okay, so it's smaller, it hits. Do you recognize that in this case, it will bounce backwards, okay? And if you notice, oh, okay, you can, you can uh, sometimes the cue ball will bounce back off the eight ball, whatever, and that's because of spin, okay? There's extra rotational momentum uh, that is involved, rotational kinetic energy and rotational momentum. And those are things that we will cover another time. But uh, if we have this object that is larger and it hits, then we don't know the speed of either one after the collision. So we have two unknowns, which is problematic because, well, we don't know either one. So you need two equations. Well, here's the other equation that you know about elastic collisions. And so that is something that we will look at another time. That is a whole other video of being able to do the math on that. So these are elastic collisions. The way that it will be treated for you is that we will have uh, perhaps one of the velocities will be known after, and you'll have to figure out the other velocity. Uh, otherwise, we'll, I'll give you another equation to work that part out. So let's move on to inelastic collisions, which is why I have to enunciate so carefully, okay? In elastic collisions, kinetic energy is conserved. But within inelastic collisions, kinetic energy is not necessarily conserved. Now, it's often just said that it's not conserved, but I don't like that. Instead, I would prefer, much prefer, to just say that uh, not all kinetic energy is conserved, Okay, that's what I'll say. At least, at least some of it is lost. Uh, lost to what? It's gonna be heat, okay? So heat will be lost in the collision. So in this case, you have two train cars. One comes in, it hits, they couple, and that is the actual term for it. So they couple and then they move on together with one speed. So kinetic energy is not conserved in this case. You'll notice that it's pretty easy to identify the difference between an elastic collision and inelastic within reason. Typically, things bounce when it is elastic. Things stick together when it's inelastic. It's not always that simple, okay? When, uh, when objects hit at angles, it gets a little bit more complex, but when they hit head on, then for the most part, you can make that statement and make that true. So this object comes in, they couple, they then move together as one unit, and some energy has been converted from kinetic energy into thermal energy. In that collision, there is energy 
produced in heat. Produced is a loose term, but you know what I mean. So it's converted from kinetic to thermal, and these tanker trucks have actually warmed up. If you were to do this many times, like hit it and they couple, you disconnect them, you hit it, they connect, you would actually notice that this connection here would heat up. If you've ever taken like, um, you know, a piece of silly putty, throw it on the ground, and if you were to do that 20 times, you know, real quick, the silly putty will warm up because energy is lost in the collision and in the deformation of the putty itself. So not all kinetic energy is conserved in this case. We again will have this same equation here where P1 plus P2 equals P1 plus P2 prime. But we're gonna change it slightly, so let's do that. So we have P1 plus P2 equals P1 prime plus P2 prime. And I can go ahead and rewrite that same equation that I had before, but I'm going to make a caveat. Okay, so we have M1 V1 plus M2 V2 equals M1 V1 prime plus M2 V2 prime, where this is the velocity after the collision, velocity after the collision. Now, if these two objects are connecting together and they are now moving as one unit, what can you say about the velocities of object one and object two after the collision? I hope that you would recognize that the velocity of these two objects is the same after the collision. So what is the purpose of, whoa, that was a bigger eraser than I meant. So what is the purpose of, well, that was weird. That program shouldn't be doing that. Uh, it doesn't like me doing that, so I'm going to scratch it out instead. What is the purpose of me even delineating any sort of uh, name to V1 versus V2 after the collision? If they have the same velocity, they have the same value, why make them different variables? So I won't. So since they have the same value, I'm now going to factor it out on the right side of the equation. So watch this, M1 V1 plus M2 V2 equals V prime. Now, what we're gonna often do is, you know, maybe one comma two, that's my preferred way to go about it, is this is the velocity of object one and two. This is the same variable as I was just about to express in terms of, you know, this here and here, that's the same variable. I just like to give it some sort of uh, subscript that lets me know, okay, that's the velocity of the two objects as they move together. I'm not adding their velocities together or anything like that. That's an often point of confusion. It's just that, that is their, it's, that's the velocity of object one, but it's also the velocity of object two, and I just want to express that in some way. And so in parentheses, I have M1 plus M2. And what's nice about this is if I were to divide each side by M1 plus M2, then I would have an equation where I can solve for the velocity of the two after the collision. So in this case, it is a bit easier to solve problems when they are inelastic in many cases because I don't have two unknowns in this setup. I have one velocity of the two objects moving together and therefore I can fairly easily find the velocity of the two objects as they move together. So that is for inelastic, okay? So for this part up here, um, the way I had it written originally, that is for either any collision whatsoever. And for this down here, uh, this is specifically for completely inelastic collisions where they have the same velocity after they collide. Is it possible to have something somewhere in between where it's not completely elastic and it's not completely inelastic? Absolutely. And in truth, most collisions are actually like that. Like let's say a car collision where one car comes in, hits, uh, it's not a complete bounce, but at the same time they don't stick together necessarily either. Okay, so the two, not all kinetic energy is necessarily transferred. And, uh, and so in that case, you would just use this original equation and you would keep the two, uh, you know, keep the one and the two separated, but you will not say, you would not say that all kinetic energy is necessarily conserved. So um, the equation that we would use later, okay, I had expressed that there's another equation, right? We, we know that this part here, okay, this here would not be true in that case, okay? This is true only if it is, 
basically all kinetic energy is conserved. So for billiard balls, for the most part, these are a really good example actually of where kinetic energy is conserved. Okay, So even if I were to make this a little bit larger cue ball, it still would be all energy would be conserved. It's about as good of an example as you can get in the real world. Let me also say this. The larger the object, the less that's true. So if I were to make really, really large billiard balls, okay, if I were to just like make really big ones and try and make them work, it wouldn't. Because the larger the object, the more molecules there are interfering with each other and trying to like stretch and, you know, in fact, in my little video here, you can see a golf ball that's being hit. You probably never thought that a golf ball was that, that squishy and flexible. Well, when you hit it hard enough, it is. And so because those molecules are deforming, in that deformation, heat is produced. And so the larger the object, the more molecules there are absorbing some of that kinetic energy. So if you were to take an extremely small marble, a tiny glass bead, and drop it on a steel table, it would come back to virtually the same height. The smaller the object, the, the more elastic the collision typically. Okay? All right, so let's move on. Those are elastic and inelastic collisions, and we'll do lots of work with these two equations. Impulse. So impulse is defined as the change in momentum, and typically we just will express it as delta P for the change in momentum. You could use a capital J. There are some textbooks that will express that. Uh, okay, so a capital J, but it's rare, to be honest, so I don't even bother. Delta P equals, in fact, let's look at this part first. This should make sense intuitively. If it's the change in momentum, it's the object's mass times its change in velocity. Its mass isn't changing, okay, but its velocity is. But what it's also equal to is force times time. It's clearly the net force times time. So why do I have a picture of this pitcher? this baseball pitcher here. The question I asked you is, why does he reach back so far? And essentially, there are a couple of different aspects or conceptual aspects we can apply to impulse here. So in this case, the pitcher reaches back, reaches so far back, he's basically gonna, he's gonna throw a fastball. He's gonna throw it as hard as he can. So with a force, okay? So the force is already as large as it possibly can be. You want to take this mass, which stays the same, and you want to increase the velocity as much as possible. So what do you want to do in terms of applying that force to the baseball? How much time do you want to apply it for? You want to apply the force for as much time as possible. So in order to do that, he's going to reach back as far as possible, so that way he's allowing himself a larger amount of time to apply the force and therefore it will translate into a larger final velocity. I can also express this in terms of work being done, right, from our last unit. So work being equal to the force times the distance. Clearly the distance between here and probably around here when he releases the ball, in fact, it's probably gonna be farther because it is a really large follow through. If you watch any baseball players, the really good ones will really follow through. And so they are increasing the distance through which they apply that average force. And so the work, uh, as far as times distance, distance which each equals the uh, change kinetic energy, one half mv squared. So there's that. But we're gonna look at the same situation in a different way. So instead of looking at the, uh, at the time, excuse me, instead of looking at the distance, we're gonna look at the time that he's applying this force. Okay, so if I can get rid of all of this. So he's applying this force for a long period of time and, and therefore it allows him to increase the change in velocity of the object. So this applies to many physical activities. Uh, obviously a pitcher, um, one thing that I like to do with students is uh, typically I will bring my disc golf discs into the classroom and we'll throw them outside and I kind of go through the motion on how to do that and let people actually see if they can throw any reasonable distance. So the technique would be to, if you're throwing backhand, to reach back as far as you can and pull through and follow through and with that mindset, you can apply the force for a longer period of time and you can get a much greater distance throw. So try and do that and give me some feedback on if you feel uh, any difference because of that technique. Let's look at another aspect of impulse.
So we have a force times time graph. I hope that by now you guys know where I'm going with this. Since the change in momentum is equal to the force times the time, it's the average force times the time, you can take the area of this entire segment Okay, if this is, you know, if it's a varying force over the course of a time, so you increase the force, increase the force, and now your force is decreasing, and you know it's been translating into throwing the ball. Okay, so I throw a little bit of force, a lot of force, and then less force at the end. And so the area underneath this curve, right, all of this area here would translate into the uh, uh, the impulse, the chase. And so you can actually figure out the change in velocity of this object. Now, that's really hard to find the, uh, the, the area underneath a curve like that. You would need some calculus for that. Uh, it's not necessarily hard to do the calculus, but you have to learn it, right? So if you don't know the calculus, you could just do a general rough estimate. You could basically take uh, half of this value and, uh, and basically just you know, kind of do one of these. Right? That usually actually does a pretty good job of giving you a rough estimate, is take half of this, square it off, and this area here is usually a pretty good rough estimate, to be quite honest. Okay? But force times time, uh, giving impulse, and the area under the curve. Okay? Always try and look for that on graphs. Let's look at another aspect of impulse. So I talked about trying to just absolutely maximize the velocity of a ball, uh, where the velocity is a, a variable that can be changed. But in this case, the change in velocity is going to be constant. Okay, So what I've got is I'm going to take a tennis ball, I'm going to hit it towards a bale of hay, and then I'm going to hit it towards a brick wall. And I'm going to hit it at these two things with the same velocity. Let's just say it's 10 meters per second. Okay, So it's going 10 meters per second towards a bale of hay, and it gets embedded into the bale of hay and just stuck inside of it. Then I take the golf ball, I'm sorry, tennis ball, golf ball, tennis ball. Apparently I don't know the difference between the two. So we take the tennis ball and you hit it towards a brick wall because you're practicing for your game and it bounces back at you. In fact, let's say it bounces back at you at 10 meters per second, okay? So you hit it at 10 meters per second, it comes back at 10 meters per second. And in the first case, right, so for the first scenario, it gets embedded Okay, it goes from 10 to zero, and then in this case, it goes from 10 back to 10, comes back at you at 10 meters per second. And my question to you is this, in which case, okay, so in scenario one or scenario two, right? Scenario one being the hay, and scenario two where it hits the brick. In which case is the impulse greater? Think about that for a moment, please. In which case is the impulse greater? In which case is the change in momentum greater? Clearly the mass isn't changing. So whichever one had the greater velocity has the greater impulse. And clearly, clearly that's gonna be the one that goes off the brick wall. A lot of people get this question mixed up because they forget that on its way going I'm gonna actually get an arrow on its way going to the brick wall, okay? Its velocity is going to be 10 meters per second. On its way back, okay, on its way back away from the wall, it's gonna be a negative 10 meters per second. What's that change in velocity? That's a change in velocity uh, that is equal to negative 20 meters per second. That's the final minus the initial, negative 20. So this would be a larger change. And so you can probably assume that the force is larger as well, right? So uh, since this is equal to force times time, the, uh, the time of impact, if you're assuming it to be the same, that means that the force would have to be larger. In truth, the time of impact probably isn't the same, but uh, I would be, I'd be willing to bet that the force is in fact larger and the time is probably a little bit more close to being the same in each scenario. So if somebody were to throw a ball at you, you probably would rather a ball that kind of goes splat on your face and then just drops to the floor rather than a ball that bounces off your head. That one probably will hurt more. Imagine a cue ball hitting you. No, don't do that. Here's another great example of impulse. And let's even just look at um, 
at the change in momentum that happens and the inelastic sort of collision that occurs. You're like, inelastic, wait, that's when an object hits, they kind of stick together and they go, to, but this is inelastic, just in reverse, right? Rather than hitting each other and then sticking, it's almost like they're stuck together now and then they separate. So it's the same math, right? So we have uh, M1 V1 plus M2 V2 equals M1 V1 prime plus M2 V2 prime. But wait, before the explosion of this cannon, assuming that this is frictionless here, the difference between V1 and V2, it's non-existent. In fact, this whole thing on the left side is zero, is it not? The velocities of both of them is zero, so this whole thing is zero. And so now we should be able to find the velocities uh, of the two objects after, uh, after the collision, after the, and it is really effectively a collision. So change your definition of a collision, it will help you out. Let's look at a really typical problem. So here we have a bullet that's being fired into a block. Okay, so it gets embedded into the block and then this block moves up from here. So it moves up and then this is its second sort of ghost image. So what's happening is there's a change in height from here to here. It is delta y, that is my change in height of the entire block system. And this is a very typical problem. This is known as a ballistics pendulum. Okay, so in a ballistic, ballistics pendulum, you're taking a projectile, firing it into some sort of ballistics gel, whatever it might be, and it allowing the bullet, the entire bullet, to get lodged into this block. Then the two masses together will raise up to some greater height. So we have two different problems happening here. We have a inelastic momentum problem where you have a final velocity that occurs, Okay, so if I were to write that out real quickly, okay, so we have M1 V1 plus M2 V2 equals, in fact, I'm gonna go ahead and go straight to the inelastic version of this equation. So that's V1 comma two prime times M1 plus M2. I'm not really sure what happened with my pen there. Okay, so, this is the velocity of the two objects together, right? The bullet and the block. This is the velocity of the two objects moving together in that direction after the collision. Okay, so we can solve for that. If we know the mass of the, uh, of the bullet and the mass of the block, right? M1 and M2. We know that the velocity of the block, which is V2, is zero because it's just sitting there. We are going to try and find uh, well, wait a minute, hold on, we don't have everything, do we? Hmm, maybe we just want to find this velocity. Well, how would we do that? Oh, wait a minute, this is an energy problem, isn't it? So in this case, now let's start working on it from reverse. We know that because of this change in height here, okay, so look at this problem. Because of the delta y, we have, okay, it has kinetic energy at, let's, let me keep this consistent. Let me, let me say that this is, uh, let's call this position two and let's call this position three. So the kinetic energy plus potential energy at position two equals the kinetic energy uh, at position three plus the potential energy at position three. And so there's no potential energy effectively at position two and there's no kinetic energy at position three because it gets to a maximum height. It has no longer any velocity. So we have a one half mv squared equals an, I don't know what I was just writing, that's an mgh, or mg delta y, excuse me, right? Same variable, but you know what I mean. And so we have an mg delta y, there we go. And let's see, the m's cancel, because it's the, the block and the bull together are both going up. And so we can actually solve for this velocity uh, fairly simply, right? If we know the change in height, we know what gravity is, so you can solve for that velocity. What is this velocity? This is the velocity of the block and the bullet together. Well, what's this? This is the velocity of the block and the bullet together. So once you figure out this, take that and substitute that right in over 
over here, okay? And so that then allows you to figure out the velocity of the bullet before it hit the block. So this is the problem. You, you kind of work your way backwards and you can work your way towards the front where you're trying to find the velocity of the bullet as it enters the block. That's a very typical problem. I know it seems a little bit like there's a lot to it, but it's actually not once you've practiced a few of these problems. Let's look at elastic collisions in two dimensions. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. I actually have a complete video on how to do it. I just wanna go over it conceptually. So we have back to the billiards table. Okay, so we have the cue ball coming in and it is now going to hit the eight ball at an angle. So we wanna pocket the eight ball. Uh, let's switch colors to something that would be standing out. So we're gonna pocket the eight ball here. Excellent, great shot. However, because these two objects have the same mass, the cue ball is going to move at an angle that is 90 degrees, okay? Uh, and it's actually gonna move along the tangent, okay? So the tangent, right, there's the tangent, and so the cue ball is gonna move along the tangent. And you're like, what the heck is a tangent? Let me explain that real quickly if I can, okay? There we go. So a tangent is a line I think this is my quickest and best way to express it. So if I take this line and I bring it up to the circle, where they touch, that is the spot that I'm gonna focus on. Okay, so right there, okay? And then I'm gonna take this line away. Okay, I'm just going over this conceptually. So the tangent line relative to that spot is this line here. So it is essentially a line that is perpendicular to the radius of the circle, okay? So it is perpendicular to the radius, so there's a perpendicular line, hence why I have the square here. And so that is a tangent line. That is my quick little synopsis on that. And so the cue ball is gonna move along the tangent line and whoops, scratch shot, and it's gone uh, into the pocket and you just lost the game. Uh, if you're playing eight ball at least. Nine ball's different, I actually prefer like nine ball. In fact, here's a little tip for you. If you wanna pocket the nine ball, you can change this tangent line actually. You can change it, you can, by putting topspin on the ball because that uh, angular and rotational momentum that the ball has, it's gonna grip the felt. Okay, so you can change that, that line in billiards only because there's additional energy that will uh, either cause follow or, or a draw on the cue ball. But without that, then it will go along the tangent line every time. And so that should improve your billiards game. And you're like, well, what is this with all this billiard stuff? Well, let's kind of take a look at actually how to solve these problems. Okay, so let's say that this ball comes in and hits. We want to know what is the velocity of the cue ball going to be and what is the velocity of the eight ball going to be. And this applies for any collision in two dimensions. The bottom line is this, is that we are gonna break everything down into their X and Y components. So I'm going to have the momentum of object one in the x direction plus the momentum of object two in the x direction that is gonna equal the momentum of object one after the collision in the x direction plus the mom momentum of object two uh, in the x direction after the collision, okay? And you have to, so you have to do all the vector addition to figure out what their velocities are before and after the collision in the x direction. Then you would do the exact same process in the y direction as well. Clearly you would have all the substitutions of, you know, p is equal to mv, you'd have to do that for every single one. It becomes a lot of substitution, as you can imagine. But conceptually, you guys should be able to understand that from here. Okay, so let's move on, lots to go over, and I'm gonna try and get this done in one video. Sorry about that. Oh no, it's Thor's hammer. And so if you were to throw Thor's hammer in such a way, you throw it at somebody, clearly it's not just gonna be like just this, this almost sort of static structure. It's clearly you throw it, it's gonna, it's gonna rotate, okay? So what happens to Thor's hammer when it rotates? So if you were to throw it with a parabolic uh, path, okay, like a projectile path, it is gonna go up along this path just like any other object does. So if you throw a ball, it goes along this path. If this is the center of mass of Thor's hammer, the center of mass is what will follow this projectile path. So you'll notice that the handle goes flying all around and it looks weird, but there isn't anything weird happening. The center of mass will follow this 
path every single time. So if you were to do a backflip, your center of mass is around your belly button. You can tuck, you can stretch out, and all that stuff. However, action, reaction forces are happening. Your center of mass doesn't change its path uh, beyond that projectile path. Even if you're like tucking and you expand out and tuck, doesn't matter. You pushing on yourself cannot move your center of mass off of that, uh, that original projectile path. With that same thing in mind, in order for you to change off of that path, you'd have to push something. So here we have a rocket, like a multi-stage rocket. And so the rocket goes up and it starts to separate here. The center of mass of the system follows a projectile path. Now in this case, there are no rocket boosters a blaring, okay? So, so the rocket boosters were turned off right here, okay? And at this point, it is now just a projectile going through the atmosphere. And there's a separation that occurs here. So this object pushes this object and this one pushes the other. So they push off of each other. And, and in that, the center of mass will still continue along the same path. Now I'm assuming that the front top here with the nose cone has more mass on it, right? See how I had this uh, represented where the center of mass is closer to the front. And so clearly the one that has more mass is gonna stay closer to this original path and the other one is going to drift farther away. But the center of mass of the system will stay along the same original path and speed. Well, how do you know where that center mass is between these two objects? Well, this is how. We're gonna pick an arbitrary spot, okay? This is our zero position, okay? That's my zero position. And that's my zero meter position. And I'm gonna measure the distance from that zero position to the center mass of each segment, okay? So here's part A, okay? So this is part A, or object A. And then I, here I have object, uh, object B. Okay, I'll label this one as object B. And so if we measure the distances from my zero position to the center of each segment, we can figure out where the center of mass is. But how do we know where the center of mass is? What do we do? Well, this is sort of like an inelastic collision. So since this is, this is actually an inelastic collision, basically just in reverse, and so the math winds up looking virtually identical, but rather than having velocities, instead it's positions. So we are essentially going to say that the uh, mass of object A times the position of object A plus the mass of object B times the position of object B is equal to the position of the center of mass. So this is kind of like that V1 comma 2 prime. Okay, so this is, it's almost like it's almost like there's a position prime. Okay, uh, usually you don't write that, but I'm just trying to put that into your, your mind. And that's times the mass of object A uh, plus the mass of object B or object one and two, however you want to call it. So notice how this looks just like an inelastic collision, except instead of velocity, you have position. Why does it look like an inelastic collision? Because it is an inelastic collision, effectively. Okay, so that's how you find the center mass of a system. All right. And then, lastly, how do you find the center mass of something in a much easier way of a, of a 2D or even 3D object? So here is the process on how you would actually do that realistically. So what you do is you take an object and a plumb bob, and you're like, a what? A plumb bob. Just as a little bit of a tidbit of knowledge, an object that is perfectly horizontal is known as horizontal. But what do you call an object that's perfectly straight up and down? It's not horizontal, it's plumb. That's the word for it. Most people don't know that. And it's really funny. When I say it for the first time, people look at me weird, like they're like a dog that doesn't understand what they're hearing. And so a plumb bob is a, a bob, like a bobber, okay, like a fishing bobber. So it's a plumb bob that just hangs and it you just let it sit and it, it'll rest, it'll come to rest. So it's basically like a pendulum that comes to rest and it just sits there and it shows you a line that is perfectly vertical. That's a plumb bob. So you hang a plumb bob from 
you know, a hook or whatever it might be, and then you take your two-dimensional object that is very oddly shaped, and you put some holes in it, put a little tiny hole, or find some way to, to hang the object, and what's gonna happen is this object, right, so even if you, like, hang it, you know, right there, you hang it, and then let it go, this object is gonna swing back and forth, right, except it's gonna swing from that position. This thing just won't let me do that. So it's gonna swing back and forth, and eventually it will, it will hang in such a way to where it will just find the center mass, and the center mass will always fall directly before, below the hanging point. And when that happens, what you do is you actually draw a line vertically uh, on the object, okay? And then, here, let me move this out of the way for a moment. In fact, let me, let me even do that a little bit better. Let me use the line tool to do it this time. So I'm going to draw a vertical line, okay, just right along the plumb bob, and then I'm going to do it again. So let me put these two together, if it'll let me, hold on, yep, okay. And there we go, so now they're together, I've drawn a line on this object, and now I'm going to do it again from some other arbitrary sort of spot. So you go and hang it, and then of course this thing's going to like, you know, it's going to fall to its you know, equilibrium position, which is going to be something like that, right, where the center mass is going to be directly below the hanging spot. You take your plumb bob and you draw a vertical line along that plumb bob, just like you did before. So let's go ahead and do that with a different color, right? So here's your vertical line right along the plumb bob. And now we can take our plumb bob out of the way and we can see where the center mass is. So where the cross section is between these two spots, that is the center of mass. Of course, you can also just take the object and try and balance it on your finger because the center of mass would clearly have to be uh, just you know, right at your fingertip. Lastly, let's talk about objects that are stable versus unstable. So an object that is stable is one in which has a low center of mass. And so if I were to have, let's say, uh, some sort of fulcrum of some kind, and I were to make an object that looked like, mm, I'm just gonna like make a general shape. Okay, and I put lots of mass here and here. Okay, notice how the center of mass of the system would actually be, like I'm looking at the purple thing, the center of mass of this thing would be right here. It's actually below the contact point. This object is gonna just go ahead and sit there. It's gonna sit there completely stable and it's not gonna tip over. You can give it a little push, right? You push it there and release it and it's just gonna wobble back and forth and it'll be completely stable. If I were to take this object and flip it upside down, see if it'll let me do that. Ah, there we go. And then now the center mass, right? That center mass is up here. And now since the center mass is above the contact point, this thing is going to want to tip over like a top. So this is unstable and you can take advantage of that in one of a number of ways. So if you think about a Formula One race car, all the center mass is, is very low, or a double-decker London bus, where on that bus, the center mass is extremely low. So if this is the very tall bus, what they do is they will actually pack that bus with weight. In fact, they'll actually put steel plates at the bottom of the bus to bring the center of mass very low. And essentially what happens, if I can actually grab all this stuff together. Okay, so if you are on a road that has an angle to it, note this center of mass position relative to this outer edge. As long as, let's say we we're to grab our plumb bob. Let me grab my plumb bob and go here. As long as this edge is outside, right? As long as that outer edge is outside of the center mass, it's not gonna tip over. It isn't until it gets to here that now the bus is going to tip over. So those buses, you would be amazed as to how far they can angle before they actually tip over because they put so much mass really low in the vehicle. So, um, so that is a practical application of trying to manipulate where your center of mass is.
All right, so that's an overview. I know it's a lot, I know it's a bit long, but trust me, um, from here on out, uh, I'm gonna be much more specific about the things that I do. We're gonna start to hit the math. That is our conceptual overview. So with that, uh, I hope that that is a good introduction into momentum. And from here, we can go ahead and really start diving deep. And I actually do really like this topic because you get to actually look at like cool collisions and what happens before and after you can start to look at stuff like car accidents because they really do behave in fairly predictable ways like this. To be slightly morbid for a brief moment, there are forensic physicists who will be called into an, a fatal accident who will look at an accident and try to determine how fast each car was going before the accident. That's their job and somebody needs to do it and it's, it's unfortunate a situation as that might be, it's really interesting to think that that can be done. And so it is these fairly straightforward and simple uh, applications that allows people to do that. So I hope you see the applications and, um, and let me know if you guys have any questions or comments or concerns and I'll see you next time. Take care.